is uh, IT Broker Tech Deep Dive. I'm Max Clark, and I'm here with Rich and Benjamin from Sierra Wireless. Today, we're going to learn about, well, we're going to learn, today, I'm going to learn about uh, Sierra Wireless and what the heck is going on, and uh, you're going to you're gonna be able to come along for the ride. So, um, Rich, before we get into your deck, um, why don't you introduce yourself, Benjamin, say hi, um, uh, give me a little bit of background overview, and that way I can level set and know who I'm hassling for the nerd questions and, and uh, the business questions. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Mark. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so my name is Rich Farner. I'm a channel manager for Sierra Wireless, and I cover the Western region of the U.S. And today we're going to be talking to you about uh, Sierra Wireless a little bit broadly as a company, and then more specifically honing in on our solution set that we have to uh, to Max and, and his customer base, which is managed network services. So uh, Ben, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Benjamin Dunn, uh, solutions architect and product manager uh, for the MS division of Sierra Wireless. Uh, I'm out of Atlanta, Georgia, and I've been with Sierra Wireless for about uh, 10 years now. So uh, looking forward to having the conversation and uh, answering any questions you guys have. Ten years, man. You're like a you're like the old guy in tech. If if you've been with a company for ten years, you know where all the bodies are buried. This is great. I do, <laughs> and I'm only in my thirties, so you know I got a, got a lot, lot longer to go. Nothing quite like child labor and IT services. It's fantastic. <laughs> Rich, uh, oh, Rich, the floor is yours. Um, kick us off. Sure. So, uh, Sierra Wireless. Uh, let's start with the company. So, Sierra Wireless has been in the wireless space for almost thirty years now. Um, we have a rich history of innovation. We have over 350 patents. We've also been a key contributor to a lot of the IoT standards that are in place today that uh, companies are benefiting from. Uh, if you look at Sierra as a whole, we're a publicly traded company. We have global operations uh, and we're really ubiquitous around the world. Um, we have 160 million devices shipped, um, 2 million plus wireless subscriptions. So very extensive. If you look at what Sierra Wireless is and what, what our DNA is, um, we really are comprised of three pillars. So um, we're a manufacturer at heart. Um, we uh, manufacture cellular gateways that would include modems, routers, uh, as well as cellular modules or chipsets that even have historically found their way into uh, some of our competitors' devices like Cisco and Cradlepoint. Okay. Um, and then we also have an IoT managed connectivity element as well. So that's the discrepancy between de devices shipped and wireless subscriptions is you're building the chipsets and parts that other people are putting into their equipment. Yeah, that's right. So while we have a very deep and wide portfolio in the IoT space, uh, what we're here to talk to you about today is our managed cellular uh, broadband solution, which is called Managed Network Services, or MNS. So uh, MNS, in its most simple form, is fully managed wireless broadband. Uh, what it consists of is if you look at the pinwheel on the right-hand corner, there's five service elements. So we're going to provide the, the hardware, which will consist of a Sierra wireless modem. We are the OEM, and that's a rarity in our space. You won't find a cradle point um, or another competitor like that that has a managed service offering like Sierra. But we'll provide the hardware. We'll provide the antennas, which can be a paddle antenna or a premium external MIMO antenna. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But in addition to the hardware, we'll also pair with that the cellular connectivity, 4G, 5G through Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. We partner with them domestically. Um, we can also deliver services in Canada through Rogers. And then with the hardware and the connectivity, we will also provide professional installation and then go on to proactively monitor the service and manage it 24-7, 365 with U.S.-based technical support. So the value that MNS brings is that it's really a single vendor approach. Obviously, uh, you know, someone could go and procure, uh, you know, a wireless modem directly from the carrier, like a Verizon at AT&T, but that's going to be presented with several challenges. Obviously, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile is extensive with the networks are. It does not cover the entire U.S. Um, so there's that challenge there. And obviously also you're single threaded with that carrier. So if there's a failure, you're completely down until that carrier gets you up and running. With our solution, we have all three carriers are at our disposal. So that includes up to over 99% of the U.S., domestically 96% in Canada. And so we can get coverage to any location. We're not dependent on any single carrier's network. And we also have a dual SIM um, technology, which enables us to have protection to be able to fail over to a secondary device or secondary carrier in the event that there's a, you know, a, a situation with the primary carrier's connectivity. How much of that do you have to do upfront and how much of that is just 
you know, in the equipment ready to go. And I, what I mean by that is, does a company have to give you like the lat long coordinate of, uh, of where this box is going to get shipped out? And you're going to look at it and say, oh, you know, we think T-Mobile has a good tower here. So we're going to do T-Mobile and then we're going to do AT&T or at t or, um, are you just pre-populating your equipment with SIMs and, and shipping them out? And is that completely agnostic and transparent? Yeah, I, I can I can take that. So we we actually we ship our devices out with with SIMs preloaded in there. But bef- but mm-hmm. before we actually you know ship the devices out, we will do an RF analysis you know of the geographical location. But even because a cell map or a propagation map or some tool on the web says okay this carrier has the best coverage in this location, you may get there and there may be capacity issues or something you know at the local serving tower. So you know a, another serving tower from another carrier could provide a better user experience so with that since we ship the device out with all three sims uh and we ship the um, we, we provide professional installation as well uh and we kind of man you know oversee the installation process we can then test the other carriers at a at time of install cool okay so so going back to value so the other issue is if you you know have uh you know if you're working direct with the carriers you're going to have uh, like I mentioned, multiple care. If you have lots of locations, you're going to have to have multiple, you know, carrier relationships with Verizon, AT and T Mobile. You won't know who will be best, and so that's a value that we have. And then you're going to have to be juggling multiple bills, multiple account teams, um, multiple data plans, and then different tech support, you know, that you're going to have to reach out to. And so we again bring that single vendor approach where you're going to have a single. Uh, bill and contract, project manager, account manager, and then one number that you're reaching out to for support. So simplify that process. You have in, inherent in it that backup capability and us to be able to uh, determine who is you know the best carrier and, and give you the best uh, solution at each location. We also have the ability through those multiple carriers to do uh, a common data pool, irregardless of the carrier or the data plan that's selected. And so that enables you to ensure that there's no data that's wasted. You know, you're not gonna have a bunch of sites that are deployed, especially in the backup scenario, right? Where maybe only five or 10% of your sites might fail uh, with other carriers you're just paying for those data plans and they're sitting there idle. With us, we can, you know, pull that all together in a common data plan and all the sites can draw from it. It really enables them to pick a low data plan, understanding that it's gonna aggregate to enough to accommodate those few locations that might fail on a given time. So it's a very cost-effective backup solution. So is the primary application for this still backup or are people transitioning into using, you know, 4G, 5G with you for primary internet? And if you're moving into a primary, consumption becomes a question. Like how do you, what's the actual like rating billing consumption model? Is it is it just consumption purely or do you have and give the people the ability to do like... Um, you know, this site's gonna be flat rate at this amount, and maybe it's throttled after a threshold. Yeah, I'll let you take that, Rich, and then I'll follow up. Yeah, so we, we definitely are seeing primary use cases. In fact, uh, you're, you're getting a little bit ahead of me, Max. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, these are the applications that we see in our space, and primary is absolutely one of them. Uh, particularly, I mean, of course, everyone's gonna um, default to wired connection, right? There's, it's gonna be um, a little bit more cost effective and not gonna be worried about having, you know, overages, right? So there's that preference there, but there's certainly locations that, are going to be challenged to get connectivity, um, or maybe it's new construction, it's rural, whatever. We are um, the go-to option for for those scenarios again because we cover over ninety nine percent of the U S. Um, you know, even rural areas, we it's it's amazing. You know, we do tons of coverage validation. I've yet to see where we haven't been able to deliver to a particular location at least some type of connectivity. Um, so so yes, uh, primary is is definitely on the table, especially with the advent of five G. We're seeing speeds upwards of um, 400 megabits down by, you know, 80 megabits up. Even our leading carriers' national average is 150 megs down by 18 megs up. So, you know, wireless is definitely relevant today for a primary connection. Sorry, and I was just going to add, you know, as far as the primary connectivity use cases go, you know, think outside the box of your typical, you know, retail chain, restaurant, construction site, things like that. Think of like maybe an EV charging station or think of maybe like, uh, you know, these these um, uh, pharmaceutical lockers or these other brick and mortar stores that have lockers for, you know, picking up, you know, items, prescriptions, packages, things like that. Um, and they're placing these lockers in, you know, you know outdoor locations where, you know, you can't just plug in the ethernet or, 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 you know, use a Wi-Fi signal um, where they need to get, you know, data transmitted, you know, to and from. So uh, again, it's just more so about, you know, what, what sort of use cases can take advantage of wireless more so than a wireline. So, I mean, your I mean, ATM machines, uh, uh, vending machines, ice, ice, you know, vending on, you know, boat ramp docks. I mean, there's, 
there's lots of those examples I'd imagine, right? And we do have, to answer your other question, Max, we do have fixed rate plans, or we even use the word unlimited plans uh, in the industry, right? Um, where, you know, there's no true unlimited plan. It's just like your uh, cellular plans. But um, yeah, we, we do have fixed plans that eliminate that possibility for overage and variable bill. Um, there's still data plans associated with that. And once you exceed that data plan, then the carrier reserves the right to implement throttling which will basically slow down your speed to, you know, a crawl that basically limits how much more you can really attribute in the month. But um, there are those options available. We also arm them with a portal, which we'll get into in a little bit, that enables them to see what their data utilization is at the given month, and they can make choices depending on how they want to action against that. So how does that work with you? I mean, if you're pulling the actual underlying dating plans and you're and, and you're uh, serving as a layer, so the customer doesn't really know, is it AT&T or Verizon or whatever, right? Or T-Mobile. And, you, you know, it's not like there's a one-to-one, -one, you know, is, is there a one-to-one -one contract at that point? If a, if a client wants, um, you know, an unlimited fixed rate, you know, well, unlimited, if they wanted a fixed rate plan at that location, we're saying, okay, great. You're going to be on fixed rate with AT&T because that's what it is. And this is what it's going to cost. Or, um, you know, are, are you, I mean, how do you manage that? I guess that would be, is my question. Yeah, yeah. So what I'll get into is, you know, we have our metered plans and then our our unlimited plans, right? And so with our metered plans, you know, a, a, we'll just use a very simple example. Let's say a customer has 100 locations. Each one of those locations has a one gigabyte data plan. 33% of them are on Verizon, 33% are on AT&T, 33% are on, on T-Mobile. That's an overarching data pool of 100 gigs, and the customer does not, uh, you know, there's no overages charged until they essentially exceed the entirety of their data pool. So no one individual data plan is going to take them over um, or have them paying overages until they you know go over the entirety of their data pool. Uh, but then when it comes to our unlimited plans, uh, yeah, we have you know, right now we have a you know particular carrier that we work with with the unlimited data plans, and we're going to onboard um, uh, additional carriers. But all of the the pooling, the billing, um, you know, that's kind of our our secret sauce that we do with our platform. So that way the carrier or sorry the customer Customer only gets one bill, um, and, and they get a report, you know, of all their their data usages and overages and data records and data usage trends. And they do know which carrier is at which site. You know, we're, we're very transparent about that. Um, but it just it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It's still one bill to the customer. So my my youngest brother, <laughs> this is a great story. My youngest brother moved to uh, literally like the, the middle of nowhere on an island in the Pacific Northwest. And while they were struggling getting hooked up with, uh, I think it was probably Comcast, um, you know, for internet, uh, he had a grandfathered unlimited plan with his cell phone carrier. I won't say which one. And and they realized that with a Yagi antenna pointed at the tower, they were getting over 100 meg on this cell phone service and had his phone set up as a mobile hotspot and then linked in the and, and it was like, you know, YouTube, Netflix working during the day. Everything was going on streaming Spotify. And we used to joke that there was like an it, there was somebody's office somewhere with a whiteboard with my brother's name on it, <laughs> like how much consumption was going on in this tower. And you could just picture it because, I mean, we, were, we used to joke about like how much consumption he had in a given month. And and surprisingly, you know, it was a lot like they weren't they weren't being gentle with it, but it wasn't that bad. But but I always kind of wonder, like, I want to I want to meet I want to meet the person at the cell phone company and be like, was my was my brother's name on your <laughs> whiteboard of like cellular tower capacity and, and what, what was going on with that? Yeah, I remember when we first kind of, uh, you know, started our relationship with Verizon, you know, they sent our, our office a bunch of those old school jetpacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we just we don't know whose name they're registered to, but we took, you know, my, my, a colleague and I, we used to actually, we were roommates together for a little while, or early, early professional days. And we just had that, carry that jet, jet pack everywhere we went. You know, if we were going camping, if we were going on a, you know, mm -hmm. late day on the boat, always use that jet pack, streaming music, streaming videos, whatever. And it worked for years where we probably used hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gigs, you know, over, over the course of, of the time that we had it. And then one day it just got shut off because <laughs> <laughs> somebody finally caught yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was the inception of Twitch. I I mean, Twitch was Justin.tv, right? And he was walking around with this crazy apparatus, live streaming his life to the internet. And uh, obviously that pivot to Twitch was was a good one for them. So, but yeah. All right. Sorry, completely getting just, you know, sidetracked here, but. Yeah, so uh, going back to the application. So yes, primary is, is a big one for us and temporary connectivity as well for that matter, because we do offer uh, flexible month-to-month -month contracts. We do have your standard three to one year. We do six month and we also do month-to-month. -month. 
And uh, because it's wireless and we're not having to do construction and all that, we can get uh, installation in on, on a standard basis, seven to 10 business days. But with the paid expedite, we could have them as quick as three business days. So, you know, when you're in having customers that are in situations where uh, an emergency crops up and, and they need connectivity fast for whatever reason, um, we can, we're a great viable option to stand up service right away and even on a temporary basis. But a lot of times that'll, you know, com companies will start with this on that model and they'll see how quick and easy it was to deploy, how great the service was, and they'll, they'll just roll it into, um, you know, a backup solution at that point um, because it's very cost effective to do so. And it also kind of gets the wheels turning in their mind about seeing other applications where they could put us in and it just kind of grows from there. So, in fact, some of our largest accounts start off with just uh, a single site use case like that. Yeah, make people's life easy, right? Yeah, yeah. But, and again, you know, besides the primary and temporary, like we talked about, backup is huge for us, um, you know, because uh, we didn't hit on this, but another value of it being, um, you know, a great backup solution is because it is wireless. It's really offering true, true diversity. It's over the air. You don't have to be concerned about having your secondary connection with another carrier that's diverse and potentially running over the same conduit or crossing paths at some point and that cable seeking backhoe taking both your primary and secondary down. Um, you know, we're completely protected from that because it is over the air. So that's why it's great for backup. It's, and then also the fact that it is dual SIM and it has that backup component in it. Um, I didn't mention this, but besides it being dual SIM and having two SIM slots in there that we can, you know, remote into and switch over to that secondary SIM, we even have a third SIM that's taped to the side of the device so that in the event that there's an issue with the second carrier, someone can manually go in and swap that third SIM in and they're off to the races again. So as a backup provider, you don't get better than wireless backup with us because you're getting tertiary backup included in the solution automatically. Okay. Uh, and then, you know, we talked about this too, but just to kind of reiterate. So you know, anyone that needs internet is, is you know, a, a great customer for us. Um, you know, so, you know, when you look at use cases and verticals, it, it you know, it's hard to specifically pinpoint, but where we see a lot of, uh, you know, traction is specifically in the retail and food and beverage industry, for instance, because of the criticality of the meal to take um, payment and, you know, it's a point of sale and applications that they need up and running to be able to run their business uh, makes us a very uh, critical partner for those companies. Also construction, just because of the nature of it, you know, um, you know, having new sites and not having available infrastructure in place today, and that's being able to stamp services right away on a temporary basis is big for us. But we also see a lot with offices and Ben mentioned before, kiosks, digital signage, and there's still IoT plays um, with their managed service. And of course, even just the, the temporary nature of events and us being able to stamp services right away for those is a great um, play for us as well. Is Searplane in the POTS replacement space? Uh, you know, that's become a really big issue for, you know, I mean, buildings that still have fire life safety systems that have to be plugged into analog ports and POTS lines and cell phone, I mean, not cell phone, uh, traditional telcos decomming all their copper network as quickly as they possibly can. Um, you know, it feels like a lot of people are transitioning to trying to do that over an LTE solution. Yeah. So from what I've learned uh, is there is um, a, you know, a particular functionality that the box has to be able to do where it has to convert an analog signal over to that cellular data signal. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't manufacture a box like that today, um, okay. but it's very much on our radar. However, we've had a partner that makes uh, a box um, of that nature, but they need, um, you know, the the, the cellular backhaul. Um, so we've been, you know, thinking about partnering, uh, with, with, a with, a you know, with, with them, um, uh, to provide that exact solution that, that you're talking about. So, okay. you know, it's one of those things like, you know, if it's, if it doesn't make sense to build it, then you just buy it. And then the Sims and these, I mean, I'm sure we're going to get into the devices in more detail, but from a network management standpoint, these are static IPs assigned to them, dynamic IPs assigned to them. What do you get from a, you know, network access if you needed remote access into these sites? Yeah, so we do um, basically three different three different ways, right? So think about your typical cell phone. It's a you know a, a private um, IP with port address translation, a private mm -hmm. dynamic IP with port address translation, you know, out, out to to the internet. So you know that's your very standard consumer 
upgrade, uh, you know, SIM card and, and, and IP structure. So we offer that. Uh, we also offer public dynamic uh, IPs to where essentially you're going to have a static IP until the device reboots, and then it's going to pull another IP from the IP pool um, of the carrier. Uh, and then mm -hmm. we also offer public static IPs, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, you know, I would say a pretty uh, a good differentiator uh, that we offer within the market, uh, and then we offer you know that with with our carriers. So for customers that that need you know need that 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 particular type of IP, we don't even upcharge for it. You know, it, it's if that customer needs it, you know, we just provide it to them. So that, those are the three types of uh, IP structures that we offer. And so those IP addresses are bound to the box, and the box is doing that in inbound. Or if you've got an SD WAN or firewall, does that get assigned and pushed down? to that SD-WAN appliance or to that firewall appliance where it sees the IP address? Either one, right? So we can put okay. our device in bridge mode or IP pass-through mode where we're just handing off the public static IP from the carrier directly to the SD-WAN appliance or router, whatever the case may be. And so that client device, you know, hangs onto that IP or our device can do the network address translation where you can plug in multiple clients to it and, you know, it's doing the routing. Okay. So, I mean, if you were doing... It wouldn't matter so much then if you are passing to some kind of device that could build an, uh, its own VPN tunnel back into your own network and, you know, show up and, and be present. Right. I mean, that's, we, we have a, customers that do that all day, every day, you know, with your Cisco's and Meraki's, you know, uh, Velo clouds, whatever the case mm -hmm. may be. Yeah. Okay. Very, very cool. common use case. So uh, speaking of devices that you mentioned, Mark, so, or Max, so here's the, uh, you know, the devices that we deploy um, with our solution. So if you take a look at the right-hand side, the, actually the left-hand uh, device, there's the RD50X, which is deployed in 4G LTE deployments. And then next to it is the XR80, which was released last year. It's 5G enabled. Um, so that's what we use for, for our 5G offering. And then below it are the antennas that we pair with them, the AN20 on the left-hand side, the AN50 on the right-hand side. So those antennas are, are MIMO enabled. They're um, you know able to be put outdoors. In fact, um, to that point, I know you'll probably ask that next, but uh, we'll start with our installations. We'll start indoors, um, but we do have the ability, if we're not meeting our RF metrics, um, then we can go ahead and take that installation outdoors um, for no additional cost. And so we'll put an email box enclosure outside and we'll um, run the professional cabling down to the customer suite. Um, so that is available and at no additional cost for our premium uh, solution customers. What what kind of cabling is connecting the your the box to the antenna? Yeah, so it's your um, you know, standard you know RF cable. Um, you know, it looks yeah. like a coax cable, um, but you know it's um, SMA like adapter. RG RG58 with SMA or something like that? Yeah, so uh, SMA is used uh, on our RV50 series, and then we actually have FACRA connections on our XR series. Um, so, you know, we can do, with our indoor installs, we do, you know, six to eight foot cable run with the RF, um, where the antenna and the modem are pretty, you know, pretty close together. Um, but if we need to go outdoors, we either do a longer RF run or we use power over Ethernet uh, with a CAT6. Very cool. Okay, that makes it easy for an install. I'll add that these devices are extreme, extremely hardened, too. Um, very ruggedized, able to withstand extreme temperatures, um, you know, shockproof, resistant to humidity and dust and all those things. They're, they're really de um, designed to go outdoors and be in, in extreme environments in the IoT kind of uh, deployments, if you will. Rich, I'm sure I'm sure if you tell the wrong person that I have a, a, you know image in my head of, of the news reporter outside in the hurricane, right? It's really <laughs> blowing hard right now. I'm like, we've got the box outside. I'm testing the wireless. It's working. Bring it on. It's working. It's stable out here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if the device is actually outdoors, we'll put it in an in in NEMA enclosure. But I mean, yeah. I, I, when I was, you know, like I said, I've been with this company for 10 years. So I started off actually doing installs. And, you know, we were doing installs in Montana on a roof uh, when it was, you know, you know, negative five degrees outside and it works um or you know if we had to you know do an install uh, in a basement you know with uh you know no air conditioning and it you know reach triple digits and, and above still works so bring it on yeah they're rated for negative 40 to 150 degrees uh, temperature <laughs> range so they're very resilient and ruggedized yes oh man okay you know as far as managed services and what's included in that uh for for our offering it's going to include the configuration of the devices naturally, um, as well as um, updates on firmware and security. And then we will also uh, make available to customers device refreshes as you know their fleet is out in the field for several years and grows stale. Included in that recurring um, charge is you know free refreshes to their equipment at those points. And then we also, of course, are um, replacing equipment that breaks or fails or has issues. 
We also are, like I mentioned earlier, monitoring the service 24-7, 365, opening proactive tickets. Um, and then we not only are managing the devices, but also the carrier connections. So we're, you know, opening up those tickets on the customer's behalf, as you'd expect, with Verizon, AT&T and T-Mobile, you know, working with them to get the service, um, you know, repaired and get the maximum performance from them that they can expect from us. So with that, we also uh, provide our customers, as we talked about earlier, access to a customer portal. So our portal is called iMaestro. It's a single pane of glass that they'll be able to see, you know, a lot of basic information that you would um, like to see, like the, the identif identifiers for, you know, the pieces of hardware that are out there, as well as the firmware that's running, the IP address that's on, and the carrier that, that any of them are on at any given time. They'll be able to see what the health of the signal is, as well as if there's any link failures. And they'll also be able to see what their utilization is on their data on a site by site basis, as well as the total pool level. Can you push this? Can you push this information into a customer's own MS or, or ticketing system? So if they're running a ServiceNow or Jira Help Desk or, you know, what's popular, um, I'm based, Solar Winds, PRTG, I mean, like fill in the blank, right? Yeah. So with uh, with our iMaestro portal, uh, our iMaestro portal is actually has an API integration with our um, it's a Sierra Wireless uh, cloud management plus system called AirVantage. AirVantage has REST APIs uh, that we can uh, do an API integration in like ServiceNow, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But then also, you know, we have customers that want to uh, be able to, you know, let's say they have a you know large customer base, seven hundred thousand plus sites, whatever, and they have their own ticket. Uh, management system like ServiceNow, to your, to your point, uh, and they just want to be able to open and manage tickets within their ServiceNow portal, which then you know opens a ticket into our portal. So we have Salesforce for that, where we can do an API integration for that as well. So uh, the answer to your question is is yes. It just kind of depends on uh, you know how the the customer you know wants to go about doing that, and you know that'd be like a separate project. It's not like a part of our standard onboarding. Okay. Thanks, Ben. So um, the system will also project what their data utilization is going to be by month end. So. Um, it's a cool feature. Not only can you see what you use, but also what the system anticipates that you're going to use by the end of the month. Um, and then we also enable them to uh, do bandwidth throttling. Um, so if based on certain thresholds, they'll get you know reports or um, notifications that they're coming up against their their data plan. Um, and then the system can also implement throttling based off of certain thresholds, like 50 percent, 80 percent, 100 percent. You know, lower them to a lower speeds so that it kind of slows the bleed on their data plan utilization. So most modern firewalls and SD-WAN boxes will let you do, um, what's the word I want to look at? Uh, um, uh, you know, throttling or, or bandwidth steering based on, you know, consumption or sites, right? So, you know, if, uh, if the site goes down, we fail over from a primary to a secondary, which is an, uh, a wireless link, uh, you know, put our POS terminals over here, but don't let any YouTube traffic. Can you do that as well? So if a, if the company doesn't have that capability in their application or their 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 network equipment, can you put in rules to say throttle or block, you know, YouTube or rich media or or things like that? So not yet, but me as a product manager, it is on my roadmap. Uh, so mm -hmm. our new devices, the XR80, uh, they have Docker support. So we are looking to build out an application to where we can do that sort of content filtering. Uh, however, you know, on, natively on the device today, you can do uh, what I'll call QoS, quality of service, to where you can route, um, you know, certain applications over certain links. So. Um, you know, to kind of, you know, expose my roadmap a little bit more um, on our on the XR80, uh, it actually has the ability to attach a sidecar to it. So then you'll have uh, t um, and that sidecar is a whole different radio with you can add another SIM. Uh, so you can have dual radio sessions running at the same time simultaneously. Uh, and then that's where that QoS comes into play where you can route applications over, you know, say the Verizon link. Uh, let's say we'll do VoIP over the Verizon and then we'll do all like data streaming traffic like mm. your YouTube or whatever over the AT&T link, for example. That's cool. Okay. But again, that's future roadmap uh, offering, uh, not available today, but it's, it's coming. So here is the pricing that we have available for the service. So we've got, um, like we had mentioned earlier, meter plans and uh, fixed rate plans. So on our meter plans, we have a 4G and a 5G offering. And both of them, uh, we have two bundle packages that we offer. There's a premium and an essential. So the premium and the essential are, are very similar. 
um, in a lot of respects, but there's a few differences that uh, contribute to the price difference. Um, and so the premium is uh, guaranteed with a SLA, a four point SLA around availability, performance, latency, and mean time to repair. The essential is a best effort. Um, also, the premium is going to provide you the uh, external premium antennas that you saw in that previous slide, mm -hmm. whereas with the essential, you're going to get a paddle antenna. And then lastly, the premium also includes professional installation in the MRC. It's all packaged together, whereas the uh, essential, it's a self-install model. However, if the customer likes the essential pricing, um, but wants us to do the professional installation, they can opt to do that um, for just an upfront fee of, of $389 a month, or we can also bake it into the MRC. I think it adds about $8 MRC or so. So, wait, wait, so, so a question for you, because you said um, installation can be added to Essential for $389, but if I'm looking at your price list here and I'm just looking at one month, your month a month on, I'll go down to two gig, $121 for essential or $151 for premium. So on a month to month agreement for $30, you'll do the installation where somebody will actually come out and put this box on site, make sure it turns on, get signal and uh, connects to your network. Yeah. So to, to be clear on the month to month contracts, the installation has to be paid upfront as an NRC non-recurring charge. Uh, okay. and that upfront charge is $389. Again, and that's only on the month to month, uh, anything after that, um, you know, we just amortize the cost of the install, you know, over the course of the contract. How do you figure out how much bandwidth you need? So, you know, let, let me give you two scenarios, right? I mean, maybe, maybe one scenario is, uh, we've got an installation where we're looking for a backup link and there's an existing something fill in the blank there, but something happened and it was okay. There needs to be a backup here or scenario two is, you know, uh, oh shoot. Um, we're moving into this location, this warehouse, and we need to start shipping product out of this warehouse this weekend and it's going to take us a month to get some sort of broadband or, or, you know, wired solution in, or I guess, um, what would scenario three be scenario three would be, um, you know, your, your temporary installations and things that are, you know, transient. Right. So, but I mean, but how do you, how does somebody size this? I mean, like, I have no idea how much data I'm consuming on a given month. Um, yeah, so we have a pretty robust process uh, on, on the front end. Um, so, you know, it's between Rich, uh, his uh, supporting account manager, and myself. We have some documents and forms that we'll have the customer fill out to kind of give us an idea uh, of what the use case is. Um, you know, sometimes there are customers who, you know, they, they know what sort of throughput they need. Um, but um, if they don't, um, just me uh, and, and the rest of our team kind of just, at, you know, a, Q, a quick Q&A. It can be five minutes or less on what's your use case, what are your applications, um, you know, how many users, what, you know, codec you're using, whatever the case may be, we can then get a, a, you know, a pretty good idea as to, you know, what the customer is going to need. Um, you know, and so, you know, obviously now with the advent of 5G, um, if a customer has a, you know, primary, you know, internet solution need, um, you know, for a small office, you know, and, you know, and we're going to install the best 5G circuit that we can get there, you know, that, that's going to be pretty su sufficient. But if the customer is like, hey, you know, just run a point of sale um, and, you know, it's backup, then, you know, we know 4G, you know, for, you know, two gigs or less a month um, is going to be plenty sufficient for that. So, you know, we, we've onboarded thousands and thousands of thousands of customers. We've seen use cases run the full gamut. So we kind of just, we, you know, by, by way of experience, you know, with this product offering has been around since 2011. Um, you know, we've just kind of, we've kind of seen it all. So we, uh, we kind of know exactly kind of what to recommend for the customer and go from there. And I mean, from that point, right. If, if, you know, you guess and say it's, we want two gig and you get two weeks into a month or an installation, and it's obviously going to be more than two gig. Is that something that you guys are alerting on? Um, I, you know, there was capacity and consumption, you know, in your, in your tooling. But I mean, is that a, or is it, you know, is that a phone call? Like, Hey, uh, by the way, you know, uh, you should really do this instead, or let's make changes here and, and make sure you're happy. Yeah. So our, our, our Maestro portal, um, does a really good job of actually projecting the usage, uh, for the month based off mm -hmm. of usage patterns. And so with that, it'll alert the customer and say, Hey, you've used X amount of data, um, you know, two weeks into the month, we project you're going to use this amount of data by the month end. And then the customer um, can then work with, you know, Rich uh, and, and our account manager and say, hey, I want to adjust my rate plan. Um, and we can adjust their rate plan, you know, in the middle of the month. Um, and, and it doesn't extend their contract. Uh, we don't charge a fee for that. Um, you know, we, we don't want to charge over just to a customer. It's not lucrative for us. We, we want to right size it uh, and ensure that the customer has the, the right data plan. And this 
applies probably more for people with, you know, a, a limited quantity of sites or a single site. I mean, if you've got, you know, dozens, hundreds of sites deployed, you're pulling all this data together. And at some point you're going to have, um, you know, much easier, you know, what ebb and flow across different sites. One site actually comes up, the other sites are off, you know, traffic is going to be a, you know, very different profile for that, that type of installation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to your point, um, you know, a customer that has a hundred or 500 sites, um, you know, they're going to have a pretty good idea as to, you know, what the usage pattern is and, 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 you know, it's, we're not gonna have to adjust their, their monthly, um, bill or just their monthly, um, data pool on a month to month basis. It's pretty much, you know, you can see two to three months of a usage pattern, make that executive decision. And that's likely going to be all they need to, to, to do unless they add additional sites, you know, for the rest of the contract. Okay. And, you know, worst case, I mean, if they, they do exceed their plan, it's not the end of the world. It's just there's an overage fee that's associated with that, which is on that bottom right-hand side of that chart. So the overage is $15 per gigabyte. Um, you know, on our more aggressive plans, you're looking at maybe a price of about $10 per gigabyte um, for, you know, the, the fixed plan. So, uh, you know, you're talking about maybe like a 33%, you know, premium to going over versus actually having the exact right plan for what your data usage is going to be for that month. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that's how that works. Um, also, the, the customer can adjust their plan um, and, and up uh, downgrade as well at any point in time. So if they up it and then, you know, they have a decrease of utilization, they can go ahead and drop that plan with us. There's no penalty or fee for doing so as well. It'll just take place the following month. So there's, as Ben mentioned, just a lot of flexibility on how Sierra approaches contracting and, and data plans with their with their customer base. Yeah, you should put that in the slide, upgrade or downgrade at any time. Definitely. So, uh, you know, just breaking down these plans again, uh, you know, you can see that we've got plans as small as 250 megabytes a month. It goes all the way up to half a terabyte of data a month, depending on what the customer's needs are. So um, you can see it's very cost effective um, on the smaller data plans, you know, as cheap as $25 a month for that central plan um, or $55 if you're doing the premium. Um, and then it, it goes from there. But talking about, you know, backup solutions, a lot of times we'll target somewhere between you know, two gigabytes and below, um, understanding that, you know, that aggregates and not all the sites are going to fail to give a month. So when you're talking about, you know, adding backup for as cheap as $25 a month, um, you know, as even tertiary backup, uh, it, it really makes a lot of sense to have that insurance policy in place. And it's really cost effective. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Okay. Yeah. And in case you're wondering the price difference between essential and, pre and premium, it, it varies a little bit by you know each data plan but it's about a 30 dollars premium to you know move from that essential to the premium offering and um, really we lead with that it makes more sense it's a more white glove approach they're getting that sla they're getting the better antenna we're professionally installing it so they know they're getting maximum performance from it so that's that's where it makes the most sense but for cost conscious customers you know we do have the essential offering as well i i mean i'll tell you listen i have a lot of clients and doing network installations where you have to do your own extension, you know, DMARC extensions from Impos, that is a big pain in the butt for a lot of people. So it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of vendors actually doing their own installs because it just makes things a lot easier for everybody. So uh, like I mentioned before, we do have a 5G meter plan as well. Um, so uh, not to, you know, repeat everything I just said, it's basically really the same plans. We have the premium and essential offering here as well. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a little bit of a premium for 5G versus 4G comes out to being again, about $30 more for a 5G offering, uh, 5G plan versus 4G. Okay. But we do have that available uh, for customers that are needing that, that higher speed. By the way, we didn't mention this earlier, but our 4G national average is 30 megs down by 10 megs up. So um, obviously every site is going to vary. Um, so, you know, it's not a guarantee. But uh, that's what we see um, traditionally in, in our 4G deployments. So 5G, again, with their leading care, we're seeing about um, 150 megs down by 18 megs up. So, you know, when you're talking with your customers, if they need um, higher bandwidth exceeding, you know, that 30 megs down, 10 megs up, that's when you might start looking at 5G um, as, a, as a use case for them. And, and I'd just like to add very quickly, um, you know, obviously we're presenting pricing and data plans today, um, but we are, 
you know, about a month or two away from onboarding some very, very aggressive uh, pricing plans, uh, especially for our 5G service, because obviously with 5G, you know, you're going to blow through data much quicker. So, mm -hmm. you know, meter data plans on 5G is not the most attractive offering. Uh, however, that's what we have today, but we are well aware of that. And we are, again, going to be um, onboarding some more, way more aggressive price plans for high bandwidth, high usage um, that will be a lot more uh, attractive for, for, for pricing. So in addition to metered, we do have those fixed rate plans or what we call unlimited. Um, so a few things that are different about this is one that's a single SIM solution. So as opposed to, you know, the dual SIM offering on the metered side, um, this is going to be single threaded with AT&T only. And uh, while there is, um, you know, the unlimited nature of it in that there's going to be no overages and, you know, there's a fixed rate each month, there are data plans associated with um, the offering, just like how you would expect on, you know, your personal cell phone when you get unlimited with a carrier. Um, it's not truly unlimited forever. You know, at some point there's a data cap um, where by which you'll then be throttled. And so likewise, we have that same situation here. So if you look at that second column, you'll see the data plan uh, throttling at and then the different um, gigabit or gigabyte uh, plans, 50, 75, 125 and 175. Another thing to consider, too, is that with this plan with AT&T, there are uh, bi-directional speed caps that are also uh, in, in flight there. So um, depending on what plan you pick, there'll be a speed cap where that's the maximum download and upload that you'll be able to receive on that plan. So if you look at the first one with that 50 gigabyte plan, there's an eight by eight speed cap. So if the site could theoretically support 30 megs down, 10 megs up, um, you're going to be capped at eight by eight unless you upgrade to the next plan, which is 12 by 12 and then 55 by 50. Wait, wait say that again i don't think i caught that correctly yeah so um in addition to you know the data plan um getting throttled at certain thresholds of data utilization there's also with these plans a speed cap so depending on which plan you pick there's a maximum amount of data uh speed that you'll be able to get for each site so if you look at the first um row there you'll see it says eight by eight so that means that uh, you know the speed will be capped at eight by eight, even if theoretically, you know the the tower supports uh, higher speeds with a particular carrier. And this is a four G plan, a four G with AT and T LTE plan, right? So, are you seeing seventy five meg throughput on AT and T LTE at this point? Yeah, so, so AT&T basically says in order to utilize uh, our highest bi-directional speed cap plan at 75 by 75, you need a CAT 18 device or better. So what we would do is we put that AT&T SIM in our XR80. Um, so the XR80, that is our 5G device, but it's also a CAT 20 and below uh, LTE compatible. So if you don't get 5G, it'll just fall back to, to LTE. But, you know, if you're familiar with cellular technology, you have LTE CAT M all the way to LTE CAT 20. And those are all different bands, frequencies that basically, you know, you're going to get different different throughput based off what channel and frequency that you're on. So essentially, AT&T SIM, XR80, you yeah, very likely see you know that 75 bidirectional cap, no issue. How popular has this been for you with your unlimited plans here? I mean, there's there's a lot of you know, I don't want to say caveats. I mean, there is a differentiator you know between between multi SIM and all these other things, but you know, people people taking this a lot. Yeah, I, I'd say I wouldn't say it's um, I wouldn't say it's unpopular, um, but I'd say the, uh, the customers value the ability to use three carriers and cross carrier billing and pooling mm -hmm. um, sometimes more than they do, you know, just a single threaded, you know, unlimited offering. Uh, however, there are customers that are like, hey, need a primary connection. Uh, I don't want to spend more than, you know, you know, a couple hundred dollars a month. Um, and I don't want to worry about overages. I just don't even want to think about it. And so, you know, for your, for your small medium business that just doesn't even want to take a risk on overage charges, you know, this, this plan makes a lot of sense for them. Um, and then, you know, uh, in addition, you know, right now, like I said, we have a single, we're kind of single threaded with our eight unlimited offering, but, uh, within the next month or two, that's going to change. So stay tuned. How does the data plan act, the throttling actually work? I mean, is this that they're, you know, effectively dropping you to 3g and you can't use a service anymore? Like, right. So. Uh, you know, we've talked about throttling a good bit, you know, on this podcast between our our metered plans and then, and then mm -hmm. this plan here. So, um, sticking to the AT and T plan for now, the throttling is at discretion of the carrier. So, 
you know, the, you, they could do it or they couldn't do it. You have no, you know, just exactly. Okay. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but that's, that, that's, that's the game that these carriers play. And, and that is the same type of game that they play on our cell phones or, or, you know, on any of these, uh, you know, small business internet plans that the carriers are offering every single contract in the fine print says we reserve the right to throttle you when we feel like it. And we're not going to tell you when we're going to do it. Um, so, you know, uh, we, we're aware of that and we're aware it's, uh, you know, it's not the, the greatest, um, you know, security blanket. Um, so again, with those new plans that we're going to be onboarding here soon, uh, we, we're hoping to, to get that alleviated. Um, but on our metered plans, um, since we own the data pool, we've already proactively bought the data pool from the customer. You will never be throttled by the carrier on our metered plans. Um, we, we do offer the ability for our customer to throttle um, or, you know, our reseller partner to throttle their circuits um, via our, our portal. Let's say, you know, let's say, you know, we have a 500, you know, site restaurant chain and this one restaurant, uh, you know, they just, you know, they have someone that's watching YouTube or Netflix or something in the back office all day, every day, and they're just burning through that data plan and we can't get them to stop. Well, you can throttle down that modem to avoid bill shock, you know, if you'd like to. So we don't throttle, but we just get the customer ability to, you know, if they have a problem child site. Um, but, it's, you know, again, it's just a tool to avoid bill shock. Okay, cool. I would say that customers also offer this plan because um, if they're using it for a primary, you know, situation, uh, the pricing here is is a lot more attractive for the higher data plans than the metered plans. Um, so that's another reason why customers will often opt for this over the metered. So you said this was your 5G hardware, effectively. So you could start with a metered 5G plan, deploy the thing, figure out if it works for you, if you like it, but go on a metered plan and then convert to a unlimited plan at that point, just go down to an AT&T single SIM if that's all, you know, like what it would require. I mean, in theory, you could, <laughs> we haven't had a customer do it yet, but yeah, in, in theory, you could do it. I, you know, I mean, I don't know, like there's, cause there's a, there's a, there's a big, like, um, will wireless work for me or I can't use it or I can use it. I mean, I still have that conversation with people looking at like fixed RF, you know, microwave, like point to point microwave. And it's like, yeah, this thing's going to work great. You could run 10 gig across these things if you're close enough. But if they haven't done it before, they just don't know, right? And um, yeah, in, in the in the fixed wireless microwave stuff, you, you need that line of sight. You know, it's a point to point connection, so yeah. it's a little bit more risky. Um, whereas this, you know, we can you know take the XR eighty, take the AN fifty, we can put it almost anywhere inside of a building. We don't need line of sight, and you're going to get you know a pretty pretty robust connection. I, a fifty meg symmetric circuit is a. I mean, you could run a lot of stuff off of that. That's a lot of voice. It's a lot of application traffic. I mean, you can run a lot of stuff across a 50 meg circuit. You don't want to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, want to push like a giant windows update or something across a 50 meg circuit, but you know, everything else will work just fine. So yeah, it should. Um, and, and so, you know, again, it's, it's the, the, the bi-directional cap that at and um, you know, will, will allow, you know, as with cellular coverage, it's hard to, uh, you know, get symmetrical, um, you know, upload, download 24, seven, 365, you know, it's going to be, you know, how many people are in the area, what's yeah. the load on the tower, you know, deprioritization, deprioritization, all that fun stuff. Um, but, but I, I agree hundred percent, you know, 50 by 50 for a business is more than enough. And, and let's be real. I mean, the carriers are running as quickly as they can to upgrade their towers and make this faster and faster and faster and more alluring to get more traffic on it. I mean, it's so funny. Uh, we were talking about like age and tech. I'm, I'm old enough that I got on the internet with a 2400 baud modem. <laughs> so, you know, I still have that thing where it's like, wow, 50 meg is so fast. Now, now, I mean, I, I'm fortunate. We, when we moved, I was shopping for, uh, for internet circuits more than I was shopping for a house. My wife was very much looking for the houses, <laughs> but I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> symmetrical g fiber is in this neighborhood. Okay, absolutely. Let's look there, you know? And, and so, so, you know, I'm, I'm one of those like spoiled people now where I've got a symmetric giggy g circuit in my house and like, like trying to justify upgrading that to a five gig service because it's available <laughs> now. Just because you can. Just because I can. Listen, it's really nice when you're downloading a game on your Xbox to be able to just go. Pfft. Now, I I come from the barren wastelands of having horrible internet for a long time before that. So, you know, I mean, I, I put my dues in, right? I started with a 2400 baud modem. I think it's okay for me to, to be in that position. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, let's, uh, okay. I, I got a lot of questions to ask, but let's let's keep going through this. I got yeah. So going back to your concern, you know that customers might be worried about you know the type of performance that they could get from five G or four G, and if it's going to work, and then they're subscribing to the service, and then they're on the hook for a contract. Um, we do have, as I mentioned before, that four point SLA available on our premium premium offering. 
So this slide kind of hits on that. So mm -hmm. what that would include is a guarantee on availability of 99.9% .9 uptime. And then our mean time to repair, we guarantee um, four hours on the network and 24 hours for the hardware. And then lastly, um, for the data rates, we guarantee on 5G, 12 megs down by four megs up. On 4G, six megs down by two megs up. And then less than 125 milliseconds of latency. So, you know, obviously, you know, the, the committed speeds here, the guarantees aren't, um, you know, uh, changing the world here. You know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, safe um, play on, on the bandwidth side, but it's, it's a blanket, a security blanket that the customers can know that, hey, I'm always committed to Sierra Wireless getting at least this speed. If they don't, you know, if they're not able to perform, we get credits. And if they're not able to rectify, we can get out of the agreement without any penalty or fee. I, so um, that's that's a you know differentiator for us in the marketplace. An, an uncompressed voice call is 96 kilobits. So at 96 kilobits, you can have a lot of voice on four meg up, and you can have you know ERP. You can have your point of sale terminal. You just can't have YouTube. I wouldn't I wouldn't put YouTube on top of this, but or four, four you can't do you can't do 4K Netflix, but. Yeah. Yeah, but it just you know, and I'm sure as Rich has mentioned, this is the bare bones. This is the floor that we. Yeah, this guarantee. is your no. This is your guarantee. I get it. I get it. Yeah. And then additionally, um, we also offer a satisfaction guarantee. So, um, you know, the customer has 15 days from the point that they um, turn up service with us to mm -hmm. use the service. If they're not, if it's not meeting their expectations in any way, shape, or form, or they didn't even like the way that the tech looked that came in and they want to spite us, <laughs> they can cancel the service uh, for any reason within that first 15 day window without any penalty or fee, um, just the $400 installation charge would still apply because okay. you know, we have to recoup um, yeah. th those expenses there. But, you know, that's, that's a huge security blanket. It takes all the risk out of trying our service and it really touts how strongly that we stand behind our service and are confident that they'll um, be satisfied with what they're getting with with us and, and our offering okay so with that that's really all that we had to, to share with you max i know that we kind of addressed a lot of questions along the road as we went through the presentation but um any other things that uh top of mind that you'd like to ask oh Benaray? i got a ton of things don't worry about it um <laughs> Going back to the beginning, when we start talking about Sierra Wireless as a company, you know, there is your managed network services, which is effectively this, which is, you know, internet network circuit being delivered via cellular. You talk about being a manufacturer. We also talk um, a little bit about, um, you know, IoT is like all the rage right now. So, you know, what, what else is Sierra doing and how do you like, I, well, you know, how do you fit into the IoT world? Um, and let's start there. Sorry, I was talking to me there. So, you know, with, with IoT, you know, it, it's a, a giant umbrella term that, you know, a lot of people love to throw out there that really no one even sometimes can define because it doesn't make any sense because every marketing team on the planet has come out and said, well, we're IoT. Yeah, yep, okay. Let's... Exactly. So, okay. you know, machine to machine, you know, uh, you know, it is, was, it was the old school term. Now, now it's IoT. But so, you know, when it, when it, when it comes to IoT, I'm going to try to break it down into two simple you know, two simple buckets here. You either build it or you buy it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we at Sierra Wireless, we we make uh, embedded modules and chipsets. Uh, we're also a global MVNO, right? So we have a smart SIM um, that can be deployed anywhere in the world. And we have, um, you know, multiple uh, carrier partners in, in said country. So you can take, you know, said embedded module, uh, said global SIM, and then you're going to put that into a thing. And that's where that's where you're building it, right? You're gonna build, you know, a, a, a you know a child tracker. You're gonna build an offender monitoring system. You're gonna build some sort of you know water pressure sensor, whatever. But you want to be able to deploy that thing anywhere in the world, and it just works. So we as Sierra are empowering companies that are building an IoT thing uh, with our modules and, and with our global connectivity offering. So then, in in this definition, the difference would be connecting a network, a device via Ethernet to a network, to the internet via, you know, wireless versus, you know, what do I have here? I want to, I want to, I want to have a tracker on my earplug case. So my earplugs are always being tracked 24 seven. And that would be, that's the IOT example that you're giving. Yeah. But I mean, it's, you know, the, the world is, is our, is our oyster in the sense of like, we have so many different 
you know, companies coming to us with this grand IoT idea, whatever it is, but they still need a means for, you know, that thing to go out into the world and be powered by a battery and be able to send and receive data and be out there for 10 years. So, you know, that is the type of customer, you know, that, that, we're, that we're working with. Not to say that we don't also have vertical IoT solutions like asset tracking, um, you know, um, uh, what else we have? Fleet tracking. Um, fleet, right. fleet tracking, things like that. You know, we, we have those those verticals, you know, a, a, as well. Um, you know, those are, you know, easy copy paste use cases. Um, but you know the, the the customers that you know that we're you know, mainly partnering with within the IoT space are are, are those that are, are are building something, right? So uh, you know uh, I think this is where like this the wireless carriers love to muddle this. If you have a large trucking fleet, you know, and you want to monitor, what do you want to monitor? You want to monitor um, where your assets are, and you want to ma- monitor sensors off of those assets, right? Um, because that's important for you in terms of longevity of your asset. In this case, a, a truck. Would that customer, would that fleet come to you directly and say, we want to, you know, do these things? Or is it that they're seeking out a solution that they can just, you know, embed into their fleet? And that solution that's manufacturing that box is then your customer. So, like, it's customer, you know, some kind of widget being being built. That widget just happens to be Sierra Wireless's customer. Or are they skipping that middle widget and doing it themselves? Yeah, I, I think uh, honestly we, we would go both. We could go either way with that, right? You know, if it's you know if it's a copy cat, copy paste type of use case, you know, for you know f- uh, fleet tracking with a truck, and then you know add in low, oh, we want to also monitor you know temperature within the truck or something like that. You know, we already have a vertical uh, s- you know solution for that. You know, I don't I don't work for that business unit, so I can't you know rattle off a bunch of details about it. But that's that's likely a, a use case that we can just already support, and and we already have the solution to just provide to the customer. However, if the customer had some nuanced in the, in that you know use case that they also wanted to, to add on to that then it's either a we would we would build on to our already existing vertical um, you know application or we've likely already partnered with somebody that's built it uh, that's using our embedded module in our sim and we just introduce them to, to you know to, to whoever that that partner is and mm-hmm. they're often running to the races okay rich you had said earlier that uh, there, there were two things right so the first one was that you know, MVS, as it applies to this presentation, is focused on North America, so U.S. and Canada, but also that Sierra has a global MVNO. So, you know, companies that are deploying and have network infrastructure in Europe or Asia or LATAM, I, I mean, in today's world, maybe that's their HQ in the U.S., but then they have these other locations, other, you know, other infrastructure. I mean, what, what, what I'll give you a real specific use case. Uh you are manufacturing something. You're based in Southern California, and you have you're, you're leveraging you know plants and facilities in Northern Mexico, you know Hermosillo, whatever. And you and you need to have backup in those locations. So is that something that they would come you know could use a Sierra for, or how does that fit into your portfolio? Yeah, right now I'd say we do really well with Hawaii, Puerto Rico, uh, United States, uh, and Canada, uh, Mexico. Um, depending on the part of Mexico it's in, we've had some 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 struggles there. So very northern parts of Mexico, uh, we've had some success with um, you know AT and T and just roaming, um, and and it's able to provide connectivity there. But as far as actually you know uh, an M and O um, you know within Mexico that we could go you know. You know, 200 miles south into Mexico and provide a, a solution uh, that that probably would be wouldn't be a good fit. Um, uh, again, it's just you know uh, you know as far as finding someone to install it um, and then you know you know billing it you know deploying it all, all that stuff. It, Mexico has not you know been been on our radar. Uh, I would say though you know if you were to uh, introduce the same similar use case you know with EMEA, um, you know the, the Europe, then you know that's a conversation that we could have. Yeah, absolutely. A little bit probably you know, UK and most of Western Europe probably a lot easier to deal with. Yeah. Okay. Are all these things ex- expected to be stationary? I mean, otherwise, uh, you know. So, so I mean, if you're doing, if you're doing any sort of like transient stuff, you used an example earlier about like events, right? Where you've got some kind of mobile thing that's moving around. Um, you know, this would probably be a really good use case for, you know, why you have multiple sims in a box, but. You know, are you assuming that customer is like deploying that to a physical address and you're registering and saying this 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 box this service is here at this physical address or or if they you know if they have some kind of flyaway kit where this thing is going to be here for three days and then go over there for four days and then go over there and then go sit in a warehouse for a while and not do anything and then get shipped back out and go somewhere else 
Is that a is that a use case we solve here? Yeah, absolutely. So we we have the, those mobile deployment kits. Uh, you know, you know, a food truck is a great example, right? You know, they, they they drive around, they go to a location, they're there for it could be a day, it could be a weekend, and you know they want to run their their point of sale terminal or maybe monitor mm-hmm. you know um, you know temperature of food or something like that in their food truck while you know while they're there, um, and they and they need a robust connection to be able to do that. You know, absolutely. Okay. And Verizon, you know, works great at that location for that weekend. Then the next weekend, they're at a completely different, you know, location. Verizon is not working well. You need to switch over to AT&T. But, you know, but that box with that SIM, with that antenna is moving. We absolutely uh, support that use case. Max's Food Truck Taco Cravings brought to you by Sierra Wireless. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I, I make fun of the carriers a lot for this and just marketing 5G is, you know, the second coming and it's going to empower all these things. And we talk a lot about like, you know, most of 5G really is, is, is a bandwidth play, right? Like, okay, you know, bandwidth is increasing. We're getting to this point where, you know, whether you're fixed or, or wireless, you're going to have ubiquitous, incredible access and network capacity and low latency. But it's, it's like these little examples of like actual real, real world commerce, right? You've got, you've got, you know, an ATM machine at an event that has to move because that event is going somewhere else or you're taking and doing ticket processing or you're selling, you know, tacos off the back of a truck that probably has a more impact for people. Or, you know, what have I seen that we've actually had to do? Um, you know, gas stations in the middle of nowhere, you know, like just, just, it's a gas station in the middle of nowhere. What do you, how do you, what do you do with that? Um, it used to be that you had to put some kind of satellite dish on top of it. And, you know, the original satellite infrastructure was pretty terrible. So moving that to cellular is a big one. I'm sure you guys all have all sorts of really interesting, strange use cases that you weren't expect- expecting. Yeah. I mean, to your point right now, 5G, yes, it is mainly all throughput driven. You know, it, 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 mm-hmm. the customers that are interested in our 5G offering tr- truly want, they're like you, they're like, uh, you know, oh, I, yeah, I have a 20 meg circuit, but can I get a hundred? Oh, I have a hundred meg circuit. Can I get 400? Why, why do you need that? I don't know. I just want it. And so, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, that's good enough reason for us, right? <laughs> Here you I go. don't know. <laughs> I just want it. Yeah, I mean that's exactly the example you just gave about your five gigabit, you know, home's internet service. I like, don't know. I just want it. It has trickle down problems for me if I actually went down that because you know, I mean, you have to redo everything, right? So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't. I actually, I don't need it, but boy, do I want it. Yeah, ex- exactly. exactly. And and that's you know, right now, you know, for people asking about our five G services, that's usually the best reason that they can give us. I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just want, want it. it. Yep. That's that's a that's a good tagline, right? I don't know. I just want it. Or or in other words, just shut up and take my money. You know, there there actually is a real practical application with that when you start talking about you know deploying network services and maintaining network for a business, right? So you know, yeah. Business applications are consumed by users in that business, and those users have lot, you know, work for a line of business, and then there's a there's a whole like hierarchy and infrastructure around that, and like if you're if you're, you know, in procurement or if you're a network man, you know, like you're a network admin or whatever, and you're deploying infrastructure for people, what do you not want to get yelled at? You do not want to get yelled at by somebody saying, "I cannot do X Y Z because yep. you deployed some junk out out in the world," right? Yeah. Well, it doesn't have to necessarily be remote, but uh, medical facilities, right? You know, it could be a oh. dental office, it could be, you know, uh, an, an imaging center. Well, you know, okay, let's, you know, it, it's it's a you know a, a medical office that is having, you know. A, struggling getting a broadband or fiber or whatever built out to it or or maybe they just need a temporary connection for three months while they're waiting on their fiber build out but mm-hmm. they still need to be able to do those massive medical image uploads you know to the cloud you know after they they do some sort of procedure you know those files are humongous and you know and they don't want to sit there and wait you know for hours for the upload to be done you know 5g is absolutely a a, a great um you know service type for for that use case can can you bond sims for people that want faster and faster service yeah, so I know of only one other, um, you know, cellular OEM uh, that claims to be able to do that, uh, and they do so with some, you know, f- um, I'll call it a marketing fluff SD WAN overlay. Um, but our um, our engineers have taken that gateway um, and paired it, uh, or and, you know, done like a kind of like a side by side comparison test in like a controlled chamber, like a controlled environment, and the you know the bonding that they tout. Maybe it was a few megabits per second better uh, than, than ours, and we're talking about okay, you know, 487 versus 483, right? You know, it, it wasn't a you know a significant distance uh, on their on them you know, doing that SD WAN overlay bonding compared to you know how robust um, our, our radio and antenna set is with our device on a single carrier. 
And I think, Rich, you mentioned this earlier, right? So you have uh, other manufacturers, Cradlepoint, Peplink, you know, companies will take and give you the option to put a SIM in it. And then there's service providers that are using these devices and purchasing packages. Y you know, so now I kind of think about these things in terms of, okay, Sierra Wireless is manufacturing your own boxes. So you control your own box and the, the service on top of that um, as much as you can, because I mean, ultimately again, we're dealing with, with a cellular company that feels like there's gotta be an advantage to using, uh, I mean, so like what's, I mean, contrast it for me, right. You know, like why would somebody go and purchase a cradle point and try to do this themselves or use a, use a service provider with a cradle point versus coming to see your wireless? Like what's, what's the trade-offs? Are there trade-offs? Are you going to tell me that you're just amazing and they should never even think about cradle point? You know, what's, how, do, how does this play? Yeah, Rich, I'll give you the first stab, and I'll, and I'll give you color commentary. <laughs> so, hey, Max, can you rephrase that question for me? Somebody's evaluating wireless providers, and they're looking at deploying somebody that's you know purchasing and using Cradle Point, or purchasing a Cradle Points and buying their own service directly with a carrier versus going to Sierra Wireless, who's manufacturing your own hardware and providing the service. You know, what's what's the pro and con in that situation between you and and the alternative? Well, we know our own, you know, models inside and out, right? We're the manufacturer. So there's a value to that, to being able to monitor and manage it, maintain it. Um, so I would say that that would be the biggest one. And then also just the fact that we have, that we're the manufacturer. So we have access to our own inventory, whereas a lot of these third parties, you know, that you're going to have to go think about COVID when there's limitations on, you know, all the um, chips and inventory that was out there, people couldn't get their hands on equipment, you know? And so us being the manufacturer, we have that at our disposal that we're able to give that benefit directly to our customers because they're procuring directly from the manufacturer, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'd like to add to that. So, you know, let's say it's a customer that like, you know, all right, they, they want to get, you know, five cradle points and then, you know, they want to, they're going to go to their Verizon and get five Verizon SIMs, right? So, but they're responsible for configuring it. They're responsible for, you know, monitoring it, maintaining it. Uh, but then let's say, you know, Verizon has an issue or Verizon has an outage. Okay. If a customer with five Verizon SIMs calls Verizon and says, Hey, I have an issue with my SIMs. How good of a support model do you think they're going to get? Whereas we as Sierra, we literally have millions of SIMs, you know, uh, with these carrier partners. So we actually oftentimes will notice issues on the network, you know, based off of our network operating center, based off our, um, our device monitoring tool. Um, you know, if there's a geographical outage, uh, if there's a carrier outage, we will oftentimes know well in advance of a carrier. And a lot of times the carriers are, you know, thanking us for say, hey, you know, we didn't know we, we, were, we were having this outage, but you guys just, you know, logged, you know, 18 tickets, um, you know, across all your different business units because this part, you know, of Connecticut, you know, is, is having issues. So we can then still switch over to another carrier, um, you know, instantaneously within those devices while, you know, whatever existing carrier is, is troubleshooting their problems. Um, you know, and then in addition, right, you know, if, you know, it, we're providing the managed service, right? So we're we're maintaining the security updates in the firmware. We're configuring the device. Uh, you know, we're supporting the device. So if the device has an issue, we're going to replace it within 24 hours. You know, if you buy a device from Cradle Point and you, and it, and, it, and it breaks, well, all right, you got to go source your own device and you got to go out there and replace it yourself. So yeah. you know, it's just you know, again that managed service offering. You know, I think just kind of speaks for itself. I'm I'm laughing about your your monitoring example because that never happens that the that the underlying carrier doesn't know that they're having an outage before they get told by their customers they're having an outage right. I, you know it, it 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 reminds me um i mean going back 20 25 years you know we'd be setting up monitoring infrastructure for you know corporate it you know stuff and and it was like it did not matter what you did with the exchange server in terms of monitoring it there was no monitoring system on the planet that would catch an error or an event in your exchange server before your phone would just get lit up. I mean, it was like the joke was you don't even need to monitor it because your users are going to monitor it for you. So um, that was always fun. Okay, cool. So, so um, you know, my, my big takeaway here is uh, you guys are really easy. If we need temporary service, it's fantastic. If we need backup service, it's fantastic. We can take and convert temporary to permanent. Um, we've got plans for um, uh, unlimited, unmetered options that are going to get better here pretty soon. And um, uh, it's a very, you know, and, and you guarantee service and guarantee satisfaction. So somebody can try it and, and, you know, invest 400 bucks. And if they don't like it, they can just unplug it and ship it back. Did I capture, did I capture all that? Perfectly. 
I got nothing else. I don't know what else to ask. Any other? Any? It's Rich Benjamin. Any any parting thoughts that we we didn't cover in all this? I mean, it's pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> Rich Rich was really concerned that we weren't going to get to the hour mark when we started this one. It was like, there's no way it's going to take us 20 minutes to get to the slide deck, and we're going to be done. <laughs> Rich Benjamin, thank you very much. Thank you.